Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alice too. I go by Alice, so feel free to call me that. And today I'll be speaking to you about container labels and current labeling from the perspective to minimize medication errors. Here's my disclaimer slide. It's the same one that you've seen. But I do want to point out that in my presentation, I do use um, examples of actual marketed drug products. Um, and therefore, I want to point out that these are for illustrative purposes only and are not FDA recommended templates nor endorsed by the FDA. Learning objectives. If you're able to fight your food coma and uh, stay with me for this presentation, then you'll be able to describe general principles and special considerations with the design to container labels and current labeling, um, as well as other special considerations for other special container labels and um, dosing delivery devices for oral liquid products. A little background. Why do we want to minimize medication errors? Um, because FDA officers told you so. Yes, <laughs> that too. <laughs> but because medication errors are a significant public health concern. Medication errors cause an estimated 7,000 deaths in the United States annually. Now, let's take a moment and think about medication errors. Medication errors are preventable. Um, that means these 7,000 people did not and should not have to die. Um, if you're a clinician who saves 7,000 lives seeing patients every year, my mission here is to save the same 7,000 lives every year. Back in 2006, the Institute of Medicine published a report titled Preventing Medication Error. In this report, it cited labeling and packaging issues as the cause of 33% of all medication errors and 30% of fatalities from medication errors. The report also emphasized that product naming, labeling, packaging should be designed for the end user. The end users are those in the clinical, are those providers in the clinical environment and or the consumer. Furthermore, this report urged the FDA to address safety issues as it relates to a product labeling and nomenclature. This is an image of a typical pharmacy shelf. As you can see, drug products sit side by side right next to each other on the pharmacy shelf. When you are designing your container labels and current labeling, you want to design it so that the end users can tell your drug and all these other drugs apart from each other. And also, if you have a drug that is supplied in multiple strengths, then you want to design it so that each strength of your product can be easily differentiated. More examples of lookalike container and current labeling. Now, the focus of my presentation for today. In April of 2013, FDA published the draft guidance for industry titled Safety Considerations for Container Labels and Current Labeling Design to Minimize Medication Errors. This guidance applies to prescription drug products marketed with and without an approved drug application. It also applies to biologic products that are regulated by CEDAR marketed under an approved BOA. In general, product container labels and current labeling should communicate information that is critical to the safe use of a medication. That means we have to consider the entire medication use system, from the initial prescribing of the drug, to procurement of the drug, to preparation and dispensing of the drug product, and finally, to the administration of the drug product. For the rest of my presentation, I will be referring to this draft guidance unless otherwise noted. Let's go over some of the general considerations in this draft guidance. It is important to consider a drug product's end user and its environments of use during your development of drug label, labeling, and packaging. You want to assess and minimize the risk of medication errors due to the design of the drug product's labels and labeling. And you want to do that before you submit it to the FDA for review. We also recommend 
that you use well-established risk assessment methods in the early stages of your label, labeling, and packaging development. For more information on well-established analytical methods, I refer you to another of the draft guidance titled Safety Considerations for Product Design to Minimize Medication Errors. Ideally, you want to create container labels or packaging that are large enough to accommodate all critical information on the immediate product container label. Now, FDA does recognize that sometimes the container closure system is just small in certain situations, right? Um, therefore, the FDA regulation does provide an exemption from some drug labeling requirements when the container label is too small. That is, provided that all the required labeling information is still present on the current labeling or in the prescribing information. So what happens if I have, real, I have a really small container label? Outlined in the Code of Federal Regulation are some of the minimum labeling requirements, meaning these items at the minimum have to be on your container label. If you have a drug product, then the minimum information required is listed under the 21 CFR 201.10i as an ice cream. And that includes the proprietary name if your product has one, the established name, the product strength, the lot number, and the name or manufacturer, name of manufacturer, packer, or distributor. As a reminder, the United States Pharmacopeia also requires that labels of official drug product to bear an expiration date. If you have a biologic product, the minimum labeling requirements are under 21 CFR 610.60C, as in take. And that includes name of the product, lot number, manufacturer name, and the recommended individual dose for multiple dose containers. Now, that was what is required under the CFR. From the draft guidance, we recommend that the principal display panel to include the proprietary name, the established name, or the proper name, the product strength, and routes of administration, as well as warnings and, precaution and cautionary statements, if such are applicable. So, no matter how small your container closure system is, you still want to design your container label so that it has enough real estate to fit all the above information. Text size and style. You want to choose a text size and a font that is easy to read, not lightweight or condensed. Um, a number of published references have shown that larger font size, such as 12 point sans serif, improve the readability of text. FDA also recommends the use of 12 point font when the label size permits. Color contrast. Color contrast between the text and the container label background should be chosen to afford adequate legibility of text. You also want to avoid color combinations that do not afford maximum legibility of text. And I hope it's clear that with the two comparisons on the bottom of the slide, that the one on the lower right is much easier to see on the eye. Information crowding. Crowded labels make important information very difficult to read. And it will be, and also important information can be easily overlooked. So when designing your container labels and current labeling, you want to separate lines or blocks of text with sufficient white space. You want to move less important information to the back panels or the side panels or simply altogether into the prescribing information. You also want to remove information about business partnerships. Of course, keep the business information that is required under the CFR. <laughs> 
We also discourage the use of logos, bars, stripes, watermark graphics, lines, and symbols. However, when such items are included, the graphic design should not compete with, interrupt, or distort important information. Um, so for example, if everyone on your drug development team is a fan of the Avengers and you really want to include a big capital letter A on your drug product because you want to be cool, um, the first advice would be don't include it. <laughs> Just go watch the movie. <laughs> um, but if for some whatever reason, I don't know, CEO must have it, marketing absolutely wants it, fine, <laughs> include it but make sure it does not interfere with your product's name, um, such that you know, if your name is XYZ, I now see like an A, so it becomes AXYZ is your name. Also, you don't want that graphic to be so large and so prominent that it's the first thing an end user sees when looking at your drug product. You really want the end user to see your drug product's name as the first thing when they're looking at your product. Certain abbreviations, acronyms, and symbols are dangerous and should not be used. Um, because when these are used, they are often mistaken for another meaning and can lead to patient harm. For example, um, the units of measure microgram is sometimes abbreviated as mu g, um, and that in actual healthcare practice has been reported to cause medication errors where healthcare practitioners misinterpret that as mg for milligram. Um, so imagine you're trying to dose at microgram level, but they think the dose is milligram. Right? So if your product strength um, unit of measurement happens to be a microgram, you want to use the abbreviation mcg instead. Now, how would I know what is dangerous and, uh, and like aeroprome abbreviations that should be avoided. Um, two publicly available references on the internet. One is the Joint Commission's do not use list. Uh, another one is from ISMP, the list of aeroprome abbreviations, symbols, and dose designations. Color differentiation. Color differentiation is an effective tool that can differentiate products and strengths within a manufacturer's product line. It can also be used to highlight certain aspects of the label, such as important warning statements. Color differentiation is most effective when the colors used have no association with a particular feature and there is no pattern in the application of the color scheme. On the other hand, color coding is the use of color to designate a specific meaning. And in general, FDA avoids color coding in most um, circumstances. However, color coding does have a special place. Um, however, that is reserved for special circumstances after human factors testing and feedback on the prototype form from all end users is received and evaluated by FDA prior to use. Here's an example of when color coding can cause confusion and lead to medication errors. Although color coding, the cap, is useful to ophthalmologists in identifying the therapeutic class of drug, it is generally not helpful to end users outside of ophthalmology. That's a hard vocabulary for me, <laughs> ophthalmology. Um, so, for instance, you know, these are eye drops that are frequently dispensed out of your regular pharmacy down the street. Now, the pharmacy is not specialized to just dispense eye drops. So, when these color coding colors are carried onto the container labels and current labeling, they have actually caused wrong drug selection errors as well as wrong strength errors um, because the end users end up using and relying on these colors when trying to pull the product off the shelf. An example of one color coding is appropriate. Um, Warfarin is the classic example. 
no matter brand or generic, no matter which manufacturer you're buying it from, it is designed such that the one milligram tablet is always pink, two milligram always light purple, so on and so forth. Moving on to special considerations. The principal display panel. It is the panel of a container label or carton labeling that is most likely to be displayed, presented, shown, or examined by the end user. Critical product information should appear on this PDP, and that includes the proprietary name, the established name or the proper name, the product strength, the route of administration, and any warning and, precaution, and cautionary statements if applicable. On the PDP, you also want to maximize the presentation of your proprietary name and the established name or proper name. And that's because these are the unique identifiers of your drug product. Product strength. A product strength is also critically important information for the end user. We don't want them to pick the wrong strength of the drug product. And also, if strength is not properly presented, it can lead to overdose or underdose errors. So when designing container labels and carton labeling, you want to ensure that the product strength is prominent on the container, is prominent on the container label and current labeling. At the basic level, you want to apply appropriate techniques to differentiate the different strengths of the same drug product. Now, because you're here, we're going to be at the more sophisticated level where similar or same strengths of different products when they are stored in proximity should also be differentiated. And I'll show you examples of each um, in a little bit. Um, some of the techniques that can be applied include boxing, prominent typeface or type weight, and color differentiation. So here we see a drug product strength being differentiated um, by the use of color. Here we see two different drug products. And we see that they overlap in the 600 milligram strength. And because they both um, begin with the letter G, it is very likely that they're going to be stored right next, to, right next to each other on the pharmacy shelf. So because you're all here, we're actually going to redesign it and make it more different uh, by using color as well. So this is when you want to differentiate different drug products that may have the same or similar strength by the use of color. More on product strength. The product strength unit should match the units of measure described in the dosage and administration section of the prescribing information. So the example here, you can see the strength is in the unit of milligram per milliliter. However, the dosing for perioperative hypotension um, includes 50 micrograms. So imagine someone trying to pick up five of these 10 milligram per milliliter vials, trying to make up your dose of 50 microgram. Your patient's going to go from hypotension to hypertension in no time. You also want to express the strength for small volume parenteral products in total quantity per total volume, followed by the quantity per milliliter. And this is consistent with the USP General Chapter 1. Um, typically, the total quantity per total volume is expressed with a little more prominence, followed by, in parentheses, the quantity per milliliter. Um, the example here, how many USP units are in this vial? If I, the image is probably a little hard to see. But if I'm like super studious, super pharmacist, I do the calculation um, of a 30 milliliter vial. There's 30,000 units in here. But why do I have to do that? Wouldn't it be better if FDA and the um, industry go ahead and label it as such? Um, more on product strength again, because it's that important. The dose or strength expression 
should appear in metric units of measure, uh, such as milliliter, milligram, and microgram. You want to avoid apothecary or household measurements, such as teaspoon, tablespoon, strands, grams, or ratios. Um, I'm a pharmacist by training. I can tell you I don't know anything about drums or grants. <laughs> like, I just don't know what to do with them. <laughs> I wouldn't know how much to dispense at all. Um, ratios, I've heard of. <laughs> but mathematically, it's very challenging for me to calculate the total quantity from a ratio strength. The teaspoon and tablespoons, as you may have heard, um, even though we may know what they are, but the problem is when the patient is at home trying to measure out the dose, they will use a common household teaspoon or tablespoon to measure out their dose, both of which are not appropriate um, measure, measuring devices for drugs. <laughs> a little pop quiz. Routes of administration. Pretend we're developing a parental product. Which of the following is the better statement for your routes of administration. Uh, maybe I show. Oh. Excellent students. OK. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can stop paying attention to me then. <laughs> um, yes. So we want to spell everything out. <laughs> uh, we want to avoid the use of abbreviations in our routes of administration statement. We also want to use positive statements instead of a negative one. Um, that is because the word not can be easily overlooked. Um, so as we all learned from our earlier Venka alkaloid days, not for intrathecal use, although intended to prevent it, has actually contributed to some healthcare providers actually administering Venka alkaloids via the intrathecal route. Um, the affirmative statements also help to ensure that readers understand the intended route of administration even if they don't read every single word. So if I only see the word intravenous in that statement, I still know to give this drug intravenously. OK, I'm hoping I'm not missing a slide. Okay. I'm trying to figure out which page I'm supposed to be on. Okay. <laughs> expiration dates. In current practice, expressions of expiration dates vary, um, and abbreviations are often used. Um, so the draft guidance that is the focus of my presentation today does make recommendations to expiration dates. Um, but I want to bring your attention to a newer guidance that was um, published September of last year. Um, and in that newer guidance, it states that the expiration date format should be a four-digit year, two-digit month, and two-digit date, if only numerical. A four-digit year and three-digit month, two-digit date, if off of medical month is used. And that is because I want to be able to tell whether this product is expiring in March or May of 2019, if it's expiring in June or July of 2019. Um, I know either way they're all expired, but I still want to know. <laughs> Linear barcode. It is required under the 21 CFR 201.25. And when designing your container labels and current labeling, you want to position the linear barcode with adequate white space around it to allow the scanners to read the barcode properly. Um, and as a reminder, if you're ever working with a small vial that has a lot of curvature on the vial, you want to consider if you want to orient that linear barcode horizontally around the curvature or vertically. Um, sometimes if the curvature is too great, the barcode will not allow for scanning if it's oriented horizontally because it's just too round on that barcode, I mean, on that vial. 
the National Drug Code. It is a 10-digit, three-segment number made up of the labeler code, the product code, and the commercial package size. You want to avoid assigning product codes that are numerically similar or identical. For injectable products containing the same concentration of drug but different total volumes, uh, meaning they have different strengths in that product, right? The assignment of sequential numbers for the product code is not an effective differentiation feature. Just to touch up on the Drug Supply Chain Security Act that was mentioned a little earlier um, on the expiration date slide, in this act, product identifiers are also required. Um, but that's all I want to mention. <laughs> for any additional information, please see the draft guidance for industry, product identifiers under the Drug Supply Chain Security Act questions and answers. It is available online. Other special container labels and car and labeling. Unit dose blister pack. Ideally, the proprietary and established names, the strength, the lot number, expiration date, barcode, and manufacturer information should appear over each blister cell. This is so that the, that the critical information for use stays with this drug product until the very last dose is removed. And also, the product strength should be described in milligram amount of drug per single unit. Um, so this is, in this example, um, it's a capsule, and the strength will be labeled as 20 milligram per capsule because we want to be able to tell that the 20 milligram is in one capsule in that one blister cell. If you have it labeled all across, and all you print for the strength is 20 milligram, it makes it hard for the end user to decipher if it's 20 milligram in one capsule or across all four of your capsules. So for the strength statement on the blister pack, you really want to identify that it's milligram per your pill. Dosage delivery devices for oral liquids. The dosing delivery device, um, when included or co-packaged with your drug product, should be consistent with the recommended dose. So if your dose is five milliliter, the dosing device should have a marking on the five milliliter line. If you have a unique product and the dosing is 17.5 milliliter, you want to have a measuring device that actually has a mark at the 17.5 milliliter mark and probably nothing else if that's your only dose. And because these are liquids, they're in volume, um, we then pre prefer, preferably um, ask that you express the markings on the dosing device in milliliters. The challenge questions. So question one, which of the following statement is false? A, container labels and car and labeling should be designed with the end users in mind. B, the strength for a 5 milligram injectable drug should be expressed in total quantity per total volume followed by the quantity per milliliter. C, the abbreviation mu G is commonly used to abbreviate microgram in today's drug labeling. C, yay. Oh, okay. Question two, what is the best strategy to differentiate between three different strengths of a solid oral dosage form drug candidate your company is currently developing. A, color coding, B, color differentiation, C, list the strengths in both milligram and grams. I hear B as in boy. Yay! If I could get technology to work. <laughs> So in summary, container labels and car and labeling should promote the safe use of drug products. The principal display panel should display critical product information towards easy identification of your drug product. And when you're developing container labels and car and labeling, you want to consider the size, color, 
layout, and any other printing features um, when designing your container labels and car labeling. That's a wrap for me. Thank you so much for your attention.